Bristow by Frank Dickens, with Michael Williams as Bristow and Rodney Bewes as Jones. Stranger on a Train. Hidden depths. Everybody has them. Hidden depths and hidden talent. Something they can do and they don't tell anyone. You might think you know someone for years and then all of a sudden they do something and wow, you never knew they could do that. They never mention it, but comes a moment and wow, you never told me you could play the piano like that. You never asked. That's what they say. You never asked. The point is, where do they get the time to practice? They're with you all the time, and yet comes the moment, and wow. Take Jones, for example. I work in the same office. My desk is next to his, and I genuinely thought I knew all about him. Until last Wednesday. What the devil is going on, Station Master? Where is the 8.15 commuter special? I don't know, and I don't care. Hmm? I set my promotional exam last week. This morning I was informed I had failed. <laughs> I'm thinking of ending it all, throwing myself under a Train? Train? That chance of any train on this station. Oh, excuse me, hmm? do you work at the Chester Perry Company? Of course I do. Can't you tell by the pallor of the cheeks, the haunted expression, the frayed cuffs, the threadbare elbows and the shiny seat? Oh, I'm applying for a, a job interview with them. You'd like to work for Chester Perry? Good Lord, must be pretty grim where you are now. Where I am now is not so bad, but they, they keep advertising for new people. It makes those of us working there feel insecure, so it's not a very happy atmosphere. You trade in a not very happy atmosphere for an atmosphere redolent of a South American religious cult group preparing to commit ritual suicide on the morrow. <laughs> Funny, they don't look like a head case. Although from the side, there's a hint of Simpleton. I should watch what you're saying if I were you. I don't like people calling me names. You're wasting your time trying to get a job with us. You're hothead. If you take offence at a little thing like that, you wouldn't last five minutes. You wouldn't even make it through tea break. And that's happy hour, when everyone's in a good mood. Do they pay you to go round upsetting people? They haven't got round to paying anyone anything yet. But it's early days. Well, it's been nice meeting you, so I'll say goodbye and good luck. But we don't get into the station for another ten minutes. I know, but I always try and jump off the train at this point. There it is. Chester Perry Building, a great ocean liner ploughing its way through the waves of industry. There's my office, just below the Plimsoll line. Mor Morning, Jones. You're cutting it fine. Oh, I was caught up in a strip search. Thought they'd stop doing that. No, a box of paper clips disappeared yesterday. Where were you at 4.15 yesterday afternoon? Climbing over the back days. I wanted to get home early. Oh, Bristow, do you ever get the feeling that life is passing us by, that mm. things are beginning to happen in the outside world and we are no longer a part of it? We're stuck in a time warp, a stuffy office with no future, no hope, no prospects. Do you ever get that feeling? Of course I do. goes with a job, doesn't it? Well, I've decided to do something about it. Look at the daily things this morning. Miles and Rudge, the firm across the street, are advertising for staff, and I'm going to apply for a job there. What do you think? It certainly has its advantages. To start with, he went out so far to come in the mornings. I'd say an extra 20 seconds in bed. It's not only that. They seem a much nicer crowd. Nicer than this bunch here, anyhow. Oh, I wouldn't say that. We've got the nicest lot of villains and vagabonds for miles around. Ask the local crime watch people. Oh, you wouldn't understand. I'm talking prospects. There's no future working here. I'm going to try and get an interview. Then don't come to work looking smart. Security have got sniffer dogs trained to spot these things. How much do you think I should ask for? Well, there's no point in asking for the same money as you get here. Ask for half as much again. So they laugh you out of the building. At least you are looking ahead. Your prospects here, with me in the way, are practically non-existent. 
And any goodwill you've built up when you first started is long since evaporated. Morning, gentlemen. Why, look. Hey, here, <laughs> Jones, a temporary tea lady. Come in, my dear, and show us your wares. If you don't like it, you know what you can do. Mrs. Purdy said I was to take no nonsense from this department. Ah, Mrs. Purdy's a fine tea lady. Salt of the earth. Or should I say, sugar of the tea. <laughs> she never quite got over the great tea trolley disaster, you know. Tea trolley disaster? What's that? Oh, we never discuss it. Out of respect for those who went missing and were never seen again. Of course. That was a long time ago. A lot of water has flowed under the bridge since then. <sighs> I'll say. Oh, judging by the taste of this, most of it by this teapot. I don't have to put up with this. I didn't put up with it at Miles and Rudge last week, and I won't put up with it now. Ah, ah my, Miles yeah, and calm, Rudge. Calm, ah. calm down, calm down. Venture Spleen on a rock cake. Are you saying you worked at Miles and Rudge across the street last week? Two days I worked there, and a harder working bunch you never saw. Worked hard, played hard. That's the Miles and Rudge crowd. Take no Jones, hard working. A word seldom heard in this neck of the woods. Now, why then, my sugar lump, did you leave? <sighs> The supervisor over there don't like temps. Oh, that was a good job. No, he was crying over spilt milk. You are here now and stuck with us until Mrs. Purdy returns. And when is that to be? Two weeks. Two weeks before we get a decent cup of tea. Oh, death, where is thy sting? Hmm. So you don't think I'll fit in with hard-working types? Of course you won't. Not the Miles and Rudge lot. Work hard, play hard. They are the idiots that played rugby in the park. Not that crowd of yobbos that spoil everyone's lunchtime kicking that stupid ball around. Mm. I don't believe you. I'm going to give them a discreet call. <sighs> Time I got down to a spot of work. Oh, let's see now. <clears throat> yeah, letter from Holland and Babcock. Dear Mr Bristow, <clears throat> we refer you to your letter of the 15th in which you threaten us with court action and imprisonment. This comes as a complete surprise to us, as, to the best of our knowledge, we have never had any dealings with your firm whatsoever. I see. <clears throat> Letter to Messrs Holland and Babcock. Sorry about that. You must have gone on my mailing list by mistake. Morning, Mr Brewster. Uh, morning, postboy. <laughs> What's so funny? You have the look of a man that's always on the run. I say, we are trendy today, aren't we? What are you talking about? Your flared trousers. Don't be so idiotic. They're not flared. I was in such a hurry this morning, I put my shoes on first. I hope there's no mail for me today. I'm suffering from concentration fatigue. No, no mail. Uh, Mr Bristow, mm. when I came into Mr Fudge's office last night to pick up the post, I saw him give you a dressing down. I've never heard anything like it. Wave after wave of invective delivered at the top of his voice and you didn't bat an eyelid. You stood there with your eyes lowered and your fists tightly clenched, totally oblivious to anything he might have said. How did you do it? Easy. I got the idea from a man I once saw operating a pneumatic drill. Don't you find it embarrassing to be in the office and see that kind of thing? No. It's terribly exciting. A spectacle of living colour. Fudge's face turning from red to crimson and yours going to white a shade of pale. Oh, boy! Shouldn't you be getting on with your deliveries instead of wasting time talking with my staff? I'm getting on with my delivery, sir. You are not paid to waste other people's time, Bristol. Get on with your work! OK, let's get down to it. Letter to... Good morning, Miss Sunderland. Morning, Mr Bristol. Here is another chapter of your book. Um, thank you, Miss Sunman. It is not generally known in this neck of the woods that Miss Sunman is typing out a novel I am writing. I have a hidden talent for this kind of thing and hope to astonish my friends when the book is published. It is called Living Death in the Buying Department and is an expose of big business. The trouble with Miss Sunman is that she has a tendency to change sections to suit herself. My section on up-to-date technology reads like a sales catalogue. But apart from that, and a tendency to drop in an occasional torrid love scene, she is doing it for free and on the firm's paper in the firm's time, and the author has to accept this as part of the struggle. Um, you've only done the one chapter, then? 
I've been frightfully busy. I'm not only doing living death in the buying department for you, I'm doing living death in goods in wood for Mr. Frost, living death in the accounts for Mr. Horton, living death in production control for Mr. Cornelli. Yeah, well, haven't these people got anything better to do? Yeah, uh, while you're here, take this letter. Thank you. How many copies? Uh, what? I said, how many copies do you want? Uh, uh yeah. Uh, what? Uh, Mr. Bristow, are you listening to uh, me? No, not really. I'm watching the antics of that mouse over there in the corner. <laughs> you can come down off the desk. It's gone. Now, what were you saying? Oh, uh, Bristow, I've got that... I-N-T-E-R-V-I-E-W. Well done. What's he so excited about? Uh, nothing. How's your spelling? Pretty good. Better than most of them in the typing pool. Congratulations, Jones. So, you've got an I-N-T-E-R-V-I-E-W. Well done. Uh, the only trouble is it's for this afternoon. I need a good excuse to get away for an hour. Easy. We lunch in the firm's canteen and you go down with food poisoning. Oh, we've done that one to death. We've done exhaustion through overwork. We've done bereavement in the family. Toothache, sunstroke... Losing our way, housemaid's knee. We need something new. Uh, i tell you what, let's go for lunch in the park. We'll work on it. See you later. You're on. Oh, I love coming to the park at this time of year. The colours are so vibrant in the bright sunshine. I'll say. The blue of that chap's suit, the red of his tie, the yellow of his socks. Well, the choice is yours, Jones. Where should we well, eat? Why not here, under the weeping willows? You mean Chester Perry Corner? <laughs> why not? Rumour has it Shelley thought up some of his best lines here. The poet Shelley? Uh, no, Dave Shelley, the postboy who was sacked for scribbling graffiti all over the place. <sighs> Sir Reginald... Oh. Our beloved firm's founder paid for this bench out of his own pocket, you know. The inscription carved on the back by one of his hatchet men is his, too. Please rest, O oh weary traveller, when tired limbs do throb. But make sure that you're back by two or find another job. <laughs> Pure Sir Reginald. Okay. You know, Bristow, this interview is quite important to me. If I landed the job, it could be a turning point. A chance, you might say, of a new life. Do you agree? Mm, what's that? I was talking about the chance of a new life. A new life. Well, yeah, yeah. Right. Whatever. It is that important. Uh, what's that, chance? What's important? You haven't been listening. Oh, sort of, but I've been keeping one eye on that snake. Ah, yeah, get it away. Get it, come down off the bench, Jones. Oh. It's gone. Oh, are you sure? Yes. People are staring. Oh, I hate snakes. <laughs> Bristow, regarding my interview this afternoon, this afternoon, this afternoon, I've decided to ask for twice what I get here. In my mind, I've already spent the original half as much again, and I'm still short. I'm not so sure about that, Jones. Don't forget other people will be after the job too. And if Miles and Rudge really are hard workers, you might have a job proving yourself worth that kind of money. Don't be daft. Look at that lot over there, behaving like yobbos. Fancy playing rugby in the park at lunchtime, with everyone taking a welcome break from work. <laughs> Especially that little fat one. Disgusting, I call it. They're letting the name of their firm, my future firm, down by such behaviour. Mind yourself, the ball's heading this way. Jones! Ah. Jones, leave it, ah. leave it! Watch ah. out! Hey, well taken. <laughs> yeah, that was pretty good. Obviously, you've played before. I've had my moments. I should give them their ball back. No way. Jones, I should give them their ball back. They don't like you holding on to it. They've no right to play rugby in the park. Let's have the ball, mate. Give it to him, Jones. Give it to him. Let's have the ball, then. Can't you people read? There's a sign over there, no ball games. The ball, please, I'm asking you nicely. Give it to him, Jones. No. Well, what's going on? Give us the ball, chum. You want us to come and get it? Ha, 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 ha. You can try. Up until that moment, things had been interesting. But all at once, an element of dodginess crept in. And that laugh of Jones added something unreal. It was the confident, mocking, taunting laugh of a scarlet pimpernel. Then came a moment of magic. 
As the man reached for the ball, Jones took off as if fired from a cannon. I have never in my life before seen such an explosion of sheer power. Nor did his speed slacken as, clutching the ball, he streaked across the park like a cheetah sighting its lunch, followed at a considerable distance by the host of angry mouths and rudge men. There was no chance of his being caught, so great was his speed, and he had time to stop and wave the ball derisively before he entered the sanctuary of the Chester Perry building. I was both astonished and bewildered at this turn of events. How could a man with so much speed at his disposal ever be late for work, I was asking myself as I walked slowly back. Jones, that was amazing. <laughs> Where did you learn to run like that? Oh, were you brought up on the plains of Serengeti by a family of antelopes or something? <laughs> I've never seen anything like it. <laughs> you were away and in full flight like Flojo. You could have been a world champion contender. <laughs> Agatha Christie, or whatever his name is, wouldn't have stood a chance against you. Seven league boots isn't in it. Oh, I've always been able to run. Got it from running away from authority, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, that's a word. Used to be a character in a comic like you, Wilson of the Wizard. Like you, not as fast as you. You are mind-boggling. Trouble is, we didn't get around to working out a good excuse for me, and uh, I've got the interview this afternoon over the road. I've got an excuse for you. You tell Fudge you've broken your spectacles and you didn't bring a spare pair. Tell him that without them you are as blind as a bat and can't do your work. And can you go home and get them? How's that? Oh, yes. Supposing he asked to see the glasses? That's the snag. You'll have to break them a little bit. Oh, I, I don't want to do that. Oh, well, it's up to you. Is the chance of a new job worth the cost of repairing a pair of spectacles? Well, if you put it like that, it is worth it. How bad are your eyes? Are they good enough to get through an interview? Of course they are. Well, then. I, I can't bring myself to do it. You do it. Come, give them to me. You're sure you want me to do this? Well, I... I was going to say no. Too late. You really smashed these. They'll cost a bomb. Yeah. A week's money at the new place. A bagatelle. And you can go in and wave these in front of Fudge without feeling guilty. Go in and see him now. You seem to be very helpful all of a sudden. I want you to get the job. I don't want to run against you on the Chester Perry Sports Day next year. <laughs> Here we go. Ah, now for some work. Uh, are you Mr Bristow? Uh, I am. And you are? Uh, Frost of Goods Inward. Uh, I'm writing a book and Miss Sunman tells me you are too. Uh, mine is called Living Death in Goods Inward. Uh, mine is Living Death in the Buying Department. Uh, am I mentioned in your book? Uh, yes. Am I mentioned in yours? Uh, you are mentioned in mine a number of times. Oh, there's a coincidence. You are mentioned in mine a number of times. Uh, you, you are, are on, on pages, pages 35, 47 and, and 96. Uh, uh, the reason I'm here is because Miss Sunman gave me a chapter that doesn't belong to me. It's about a jewel robbery. Is it yours? No, but it sounds interesting, and I'll take it. Uh, I'm bound to be able to fit it in somewhere. Thanks a lot. Uh, this place doesn't change much. I haven't been in here for years. Uh, who's your boss? Uh, Fudge, isn't it? Mm. <laughs> How is the old sourpuss? Uh, he's not the man he was, of course. There are signs his memory is beginning to fail him. Oh, dear. Not so much in the big things, you notice in the little things. For instance, he forgot to wipe the grin off his face before he came in this morning. Mm, nice one. Uh, mind if I put it in my book? I've already done it. Oh, never mind. Uh, uh, best of luck. Uh... <laughs> yeah. Ooh, and now for some serious work. It worked. Well done. Uh, what time is your interview? Like now. See you later. Wish me luck. You don't need it. And now, to get down to some work. I don't believe it. Window cleaners, anything to stop me working. See that, Godfrey? That poor devil is called a white-collar worker. A typical no-hoper chained to a desk all day. Now, remember what I say, son. If you don't keep your chamois lever in good condition, you could end up like that. No, 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 Dad, no, no. <laughs> you and me both, kid. Look out. I'm going to open it. <coughs> <coughs> Good afternoon. 
Would you mind cleaning that bottom left-hand corner so that I can see my escape route? Uh, with pleasure, sir. <laughs> Say thank you to the man, Godfrey. Thank you. Uh, Godfrey, this is a white-collar worker. Uh, you don't mind if I call you that, sir? <laughs> I'm not exactly white-collar. My washing machine has been playing up a lot recently. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Godfrey seems very keen. He's soaping the bottom of my jacket. He's my son. He only started last week. Certainly enjoys climbing up and down the ladder. I've told him... Every time he gets to the top, he should pretend he's saving someone from a burning building. What the devil is going on? Bristol! Come away from that window and let that man get on with his work. Uh, yes, Mr. Fudge. Certainly, Mr. Fudge. Right away. Mr. Fudge. I want no more time wasted, you hear? Get onto Mercer's gun and frames and sort this order out! Stab me. Why me? Why can't he pick up the phone and do it himself? Just because he's chief buyer. Yes? Mary, get me gun and flames right away. If I give you a line, can you get it yourself? Why should I? That's what we pay you for. Oh, hoity toity. Gun and flames, Kerwin speaking. It's about our order number DB564. Yeah, you would have to ask for that one. It means going downstairs. Um, don't worry. Perhaps we can deal with JRT9983. Would you believe that's downstairs too? <sighs> How about DLT756? <laughs> you certainly pick them. You don't tell me that's downstairs as well. Yeah, they're all downstairs. I'm sunbathing up on the roof. <sighs> Mr Bristow, I've reached the end of my tether. Which one? The 9.30 tether, the mid-morning tether, the just-before-lunch tether, the 3.15 tether. No post to go down? What's the time? I'll soon tell you. Watch this. I reach for my hat, thus... Not yet, Bristol. It's only 20 past four. Does that answer your question? Thanks. Ta-ta. <sighs> Alone at last. It's been a long day. Ah, <sighs> Hey, I've just realised something. By leaning back in my chair, I can see the window box in the office across the street. And by covering my left eye and squinting through the fingers of my right hand, I can eliminate all the surrounding brickwork, and all I can see is a bunch of cool green leaves. Suddenly, I'm miles away in the heart of the countryside. Uh, Jones, our congratulations in order. Are they hell? Complete shambles. Hopeless. Waste of time. As soon as I walked in the room, I knew I was wasting my time. He just looked at me and I knew. Did you mention your years of experience? I didn't. For the simple reason I knew he wouldn't have been interested. And he didn't ask you? He didn't want to know. You told him you worked for Chester Perris. He already knew. I don't get it. He knew you worked here and he wasn't interested. And he was in personnel. His job was personnel selection. A man working in Miles and Rudge personnel selection, turning down people with experience from here. What does he want? He wants his ball back. Meet again. Hmm? You didn't get a chance to jump off the train this morning. I beg your pardon? It, oh, I remember. I didn't recognise you with all those bandages on your face. You're the gentleman that works for Miles and Rudge, hmm. who was going for an interview at our place. How did it go? It never happened. I never went. I wouldn't work for a firm like Chester Perry's if they were the last firm on earth. They're all morons. Hmm? I take my lunch in the park every day. I like to have a bit of peace and quiet over lunchtime. Of late, this... Peace and calm has been interrupted by a gang of yobbos who've taken to playing rugby of all games on the open stretch of grass near the willow trees, in spite of the notices forbidding the playing of ball games. I would have reported them had I been able to ascertain the firm they worked for. But today, I was approaching my regular bench when I saw one of them carrying a ball running towards me so quickly I had to do a sidestep, ah. a, a hidden talent I possess, uh, to avoid being brought down. Mm. To my astonishment, he ran across to the Chester Perry building and disappeared inside. Oh, that was all I saw before those running after him knocked me to the ground and I sustained the injuries which you now perceive. They ought to be locked up. Animals like that. There's a law against that kind of thing. Tomorrow my report will go in. 
לא... לא... זה... סיטרה. אה... 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 Bristow was written by Frank Dickens and featured Michael Williams as Bristow, Rodney Buse as Jones, John Glover as Fudge, Mr. Frost, the Station Master and the Stranger on the Train, Katie Odie as Miss Sunman, Simon Schatzberger as the Postboy and Godfrey, and Sarah Huntley as the Tea Lady. The music was composed and performed by John Whitehall.